It's before finitude. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> a similar emerging trend can be found in continental philosophy and contemporary artistic practice in which linguistically oriented paradigms of thought and interpretation wrestle forcefully with those more invested in the material properties of objects. In philosophy, the broadly textual, discursive, and deconstructivist methods that characterize much of the past several decades of thought have met more recently with the turn to philosophical realism emblematized in the watershed work by contemporary French philosopher Quentin Mayassou after Finitude. <coughs> Mayassou argues that since Kant's so-called Copernican Revolution, philosophy has split into separate autonomous spheres of thinking and being, leaving as a remainder only the correlation between the two. This correlationism, uh, Mayassou uh, maintains, which has characterized most non-naive thought since Kant, has prevented thinking from getting outside of itself to the great outdoors to access the object in itself. This essay attempts to contrast the philosophical position advanced by Mayassou in which thought claims access to its outside with the inside of thought's institutional housing, the system of higher education that appears more and more to conform to the logic of neoliberal capitalism. What is the relationship uh, between the advancement of so-called knowledge capitalism and the return of, of philosophy's claim to a knowledge of the real? And how might artistic practice provide a meaningful intervention? Artist Cassie Thornton's Debt to Space program attempts to critically frame student debt in relation to the broader debt economy, arguably the primary economic basis underpinning the current system of higher education. What is the material of your debt? asks Thornton in a public questionnaire found on the, on the artist's website. Through her Sound of Debt series, Thornton's work points to a debt imaginary by underlining debt's affective, social, and material substance, linking it essentially, I claim, to a materialist philosophical engagement. While critically examining the recent application of philosophical realism to sound slash musical practice, I will also attempt to present a conception of debt, education, and knowledge production in an intervention aimed towards Maya Su and the recent revival of philosophical uh, realism slash materialism. Materialism, the tradition of thought into which Maya Su intervenes, has in addition to education held an important if complicated relationship to science. Um, after finitude's point of departure comes from what Mayasu calls arc fossils, forensic evidence of, of the existence of reality prior to humanity, produced, for instance, by the Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe. The latter was part of a recent culminated research program conducted by NASA estimating the age of the universe at roughly 13.7772 billion years give or take 59 million. <laughs> uh, take, taken literally, information provided by the ARC fossil, namely the fact that there was a reality before humans existed, proves from ASU that the correlation between thinking and being has not always been and need not be because at one point the two did not coexist. Mayasu explains every materialism that would be speculative and hence for which absolute reality is an entity without thought must assert that both thought is not necessary, something can be independently, can be independently of thought, and that thought can think what there must be when there is no thought. The, uh, end of quote. The, the conflict engaged by Mayasu and others who have allied themselves with speculative realism converges on what Althusser has called the, quote, great debate dominating the history of philosophy, uh, the distinction between philosophical materialism and idealism. The former, which contends, according to uh, philosopher Adrian Johnston, that there is a hard, mind-independent reality and nothing more, is positioned against the latter, a label increasingly applied to the recent old guard of European philosophy, strongly uh, conceived broadly as textual or deconstructivist, or in Mayasu's terms, adopt adopting a form of strong correlationism. In addition to the disparity between Mayasu and the, in the enumer enumerated types of correlationism, there are also clear <coughs> excuse me, di differences between Mayasu's and Marx's materialisms found both in the types of science referred to and in Marx's distinct accents on education and human action. Indeed, what is left out of the thinking being dyad presupposed by Mayasu's term correlationism is uh, indeed none other than doing. <laughs> 
It is practice, critical, sorry, practical critical social activity that initiates Marx's theses on Feuerbach. An 11 point list offering a critique of the prevailing old materialist who are stuck, as Marx saw it, in a quote, contemplative mode, uh, unable to intervene in the real posited by their philosophy. Uh, against the, the abstract materialism of natural science, Marx pits a materialism based on human production. Importantly, and as I will expand upon later, Mayasu's materialism has less to do with the materialism of Marx than it does uh, with the Marxists of the 20th century, such as Lenin and Althusser. Uh, the conception of science linking the, linking the materialist thought of Mayasu and Lenin and others is, according to uh, Paul Thomas, likely based on the English translation of science of Marx's Wissenschaft. Um, the latter more often translated to mean learning, scholarship, erudition, and knowledge. Uh, unlike Mayasu's, Marx's materialism, as this translational snafu points out, turns precisely on the question of education. Marx responds to the old materialist doctrines that since there is a determinate reality and, quote, men are products of, of circumstances and upbringing, end of quote, change can occur simply through education. The enlightened only have to teach the have-nots and our social ills will be cured. This forgets, Marx asserts, that, quote, the educator himself must be educated, end of quote. As a consequence of Marx's the uh, theses on Feuerbach, there is, according to Rancière, uh, an imperative for a new knowledge, quote, an, intelligent, uh, an intelligence formed in the struggle. Uh, a kind of intelligence over and above, uh, sorry, over and beyond philosophy, action is, for Marx, primary. As Rancière remarks in his polemic against Althusser, the latter's philosophical practice, as opposed to practice as such, for Rancière, flies in the face of Marx's critique of the old materialism's hierarchical value of merely attempting to educate the oppressed. Moving to the present, is there not, however, a conspicuous, if dubious, consonance between Marx's formulation of practice and the pervasive conceptions of social practice, one of the latest pedagogical uh, products offered by MFA programs across North America? Um, is there nevertheless a critical dimension of artistic practice recuperable within this configuration? Like philosophy, Am I still on the right slide here? I think so. Okay. Uh, <laughs> like philosophy, contemporary art has also witnessed a resting of attention from the conceptual and discursive strategies of the past half decade to a reconsideration of practices rooted in uh, categories devoted to specific materials, objects, and physical things. The tendencies of Rosalind Krauss's post-medium uh, post condition practices defined against the essentialist conceptions of media in the wake of Greenbergian modernism rub up against this return of the medium-specific tendencies in, for instance, what might be termed the recent sonic turn, a proliferation of literature, artistic practices, criticism, and theory attempting to consider sound in its material form and substance. Why contemporary art has undergone an ostensible regression in many instances uh, to fixate upon the lowest common denominator of, of uh, Sorry, uh, while well, contemporary art has undergone an essential re regression in many in instances to classical object making um, in, in an attempt to assimilate speculative realism might only indicate a tendency to fixate upon the lowest common denominator of vanguard theoretical trends. Already in the work of Marcel Brut there is do we find a critical materialist response to conceptual art and institutional critique while refusing to accept, according to Benjamin Buclo, uh, a purely linguistic or theoretical critique of commodification. With the canny clairvoyance of the materialist, insists Buclo, Brut Thayer's, quote, foresaw that the radical institutional critique of, the late six, of his late 60s peers would end in a mere expansion of the field of exclusively spatial, plastic, and aesthetic concerns. Why hasn't speculative realism ignited, for example, an explosion beyond the first generation of institutional critique artists, Michael Asher, Robert Smithson, uh, Hans Hacke, considering their, quote, materialist praxis lucidly aware of its context. That's a quote from Brian Holmes. Um, through various recent attempts, uh, th though various recent attempts have been made to formulate connections between contemporary art and speculative realism, last year's Documenta 13, 
blow up uh, speculative, real, speculative realities in Amsterdam and Basel's recent uh, aesthetics of the 20th century and 21st century in which Graham, Graham Harmon was a keynote speaker, sound provides an instructive point of entry. One of its more outspoken debates, for instance, centers precisely around the conflict between an approach labeled sonic idealism and another perspective purported to contribute directly to, quote, the revival of realism in contemporary philosophy, end of quote, and that's Christoph Cox. Um, perhaps more interestingly, as a matter of sensuous flow, sound compels us to think process. Like philosophical materialism, it is contest contestory, conflictual, contradictory. Um, so earlier this summer, following the culmination of a weekly series of reading group meetings entitled Autonomia Occupy Communism Legacies of the Future, uh, held at the E-Flux space in New York, artist Cassie Thornton led a participatory group performance as part of her ongoing series, The Debt to Space Program. The event consisted of a group of about 10 participants who, following Thornton's lead, stood in a circle shoulder to shoulder and proceeded to follow instructions for a guided exercise. Structured like a group med meditation, with eyes closed, participants were asked to visualize their various forms of personal financial debt before attempting to collectively transmit these debts to outer space by emitting a loud concerted scream. <laughs> <coughs> Close your eyes and feel your feet on the floor, Thornton began slowly and deliberately. She continued, asking the group to move in so that partic participants were touching each other. Imagine your feet going through the floor, into the basement, and past the subway. Something is enclosing you, she went on. Try to get as much of it in your mouth as you can. You're eating it, and you're chewing it, and you're digesting it, and it's really hard. Once that's happened, slowly come back up onto the earth. You might have to break through this hard wood floor. Feel the energy this thing has given you and watch it as it travels up through your body to your throat. I'm going to count to three. You're going to open your eyes. You're going to scream out the thing. Lasting less than 10 seconds, the group's scream was as loud as it was shrill an eruptive shriek piercing the preceding calm. After this cathartic expurgation had concluded, Thornton sent around a form re requesting a signature from each participant to indicate an identification with one of several statements like, I have a tremendous amount of health care debt, I cannot afford basic necessities, and I have to work for the rest of my life because I have student debt. Each item, according to the survey, was was to be exported to space through the screen. Um, so Thornton's guided exercises can be said to evoke the various visualization techniques used in middle-class self-help programs, group therapy, and 12-step programs. The screams might also be, be considered as acts of purgation, mirroring the basic structure of psychoanalysis uh, with the roots of the talking cure found in what Freud called the cathartic <laughs> method. Uh, still a more, Still, an, uh, another point of reference may be drawn to avant-garde noise or the neo-avant-garde perform performance practices of fluxus and experimental music. Um, Yoko Ono's 1961 score voice for, uh, sorry, voice piece for soprano, for example, reads, as you can see, scream against the wind, against the wall, against the sky. Like Ono's piece, voice piece for soprano, Thornton's screams employ structures of collective sounding and enunciation particular to music while framing the voice as abject force. The score's repetition of against redoubles the scream's singularly confrontational, antagonistic, and contrarian quality. While also sharing the, the agonistic character of Ono's piece, Thornton's debt to space program replaces Ono's abyssal sky with the beyond of outer space. Space, Thornton's ostensibly utopian repository for the receipt of debts of earthlings, reads also perhaps as, as a metonym for science at large, pointing further perhaps to the kinds of NASA emissions responsible for, among other things, 
uncovering evidence of arc fossils, Thornton's intervention grounds a lived and embodied physicality against the far-flung speculative investments uh, in science offered by neorealists like Maya Sue. As an artistic practice, Thornton's work can be said to advance a practical critical engagement with the conditions of its material production. As an artist who, who went into substantial debt while earning an MFA, Thornton's materials become both subject and object of her work. Thornton's debt to space program brings the subjectivity of debt into contact with a collectivization threading experiences of neoliberal precarity and capitalist violence incurred through indebtedness. While Thornton has explained her project broadly as an attempt to, quote, understand finance in an affective way, end of quote, and indeed subjective experiences of debt are foregrounded in her practice, of equal importance are the dimensions of collectivity and sociality. In a statement describing the founding of her so-called feminist economics department, or the Fed, uh, Thornton locates a, quote, desire for collectivity based on an interest in the debt industry which promotes individual liability and denies trust and interdependence. While on the other hand, her interventions might be criticized as pathologizing debt, as centering around subjective experiences of a phenomenon more properly understood in, in political economic terms. On, on, on the other, um, taking debt as inherently social, uh, Thornton's group interventions can be read as staging a form of collectivity not unlike tactics used in groups formed around education, debt, and pedagogy. Relevantly, in his well-known essay, The Making of the Indebted Man, uh, Maurizio Lazzarato has argued that debt is, quote, a mechanism for the production and government of collective and individual subjectivity. The, quote, logic of debt, he asserts, has come to pervade the social. Um, the question as to the philosophical implications of Thornton's work, how is debt to be configured materially, becomes complicated in considering debt as a phenomenon, along with Thornton's own statements around her project. In the short talk concluding her debt to space event at Eflux, Thornton spoke about the possibility of debt as an idea form, and therefore a structure that is malleable. Citing the Tibetan Buddhist concept of the tulpa, she proposed debt as, quote, something that becomes real due to enough people thinking about it. But does this not operate as the purest of idealist uh, statements? Debt is real because people think it. Certainly there is the naive thought that if I don't acknowledge and then never pay back my debt, it might be said to have no reality. And indeed, if one, and, and indeed one might reference the historical moments when, uh, when one could simply move to a different city to escape debt. Um, Considering the ways in which it's come to shape everything from nation states to private enterprise to education and knowledge, is not debt becoming the material force in our world? Beyond the simplistic question of whether debt is real or merely an idea, the significant dimension in Th of Thornton's work, I contend, is the tension between debt as a real aff affective object and debt as a material socioeconomic process. It is important in working through this, however, that debt is not essentialized. What, if anything, is in common between the debt of a, wealth, a wealthy venture capitalist uh, and debilitating medical debt incurred by poor people of color? Debt should be understood perhaps as nothing more than the symptom of a broader economic logic more and more based on financialization and speculation. Debt is, again, in Lazzarato's words, no less than the, quote, strategic heart of neoliberal politics. Following the event at Eflux, Thornton pre uh, presented several further iterations of the debt to space program, occurring at, at scheduled times over the course of, of five even evenings, groups of debtors gathered in person at, uh, at, at Port Portland's Pioneer Square, while others phoned in their screams using a 1-800 number. <laughs> the screams were delivered, according to Thornton, uh, beyond the debt ceiling, when later aired on a radio station in the area. The bygone era kitsch of 1-800 numbers, radio broadcast, and NASA contrast with the futurity, the beyondness of space, calling forth the experience of a seemingly never-ending deferral into the future. Through the intersection of space and debt, one is harkened to an earlier time of grand ambitions and large-scale collective projects like space exploration. The contemplation then moves to the present to consider the erosion of public programs like NASA, but also the increasingly privatized domains of housing, healthcare, and education.
um, interventions around student debt uh, have become, uh, become foregrounded in Thornton's work. She describes the debt to space program as a quote, a uh, multifaceted effort, effort to export the behavioral, psychological, and emotional ramifications of all types of financial hardship, which uses screaming uh, to translate, uh, transmit to space uh, feelings of limitation inspired by student debt. While participants of the student, uh, the debt to space program revealed difficulties re resulting from a variety of types of debt um, in, in the earlier mentioned survey uh, taken following the, the event, other projects confirm this, the uh, focus on student debt. In her application to the London School of Economics, for example, this was her MFA project, uh, Thornton uses a pair of Richard Serra works to illustrate graphically how much the total amount of US credit card debt is exceeded, you can see on the right hand side versus the left, by the sum of America's student loan debt. One crucial characteristic of student debt, as Lee Claire LaBerge notes in a forthcoming essay on Thornton, is that it is unsecured. Unlike a mortgage, there is no collateral, no object of investment other than the student herself. Invest in yourself, the adage goes. Um, an, Im Im an important, another important difference is that since 1998, US Congress has made non-dischargeable federal loans and since 2005, private loans. Uh, the debt to space program can be considered as a continuation of the debt visualizations Thornton gave, uh, 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 sorry, that, that she began during uh, her acquisition of approximately $100,000 of US government subsidized loans while an MFA student in social practice at <laughs> California College of the Arts culminating in her thesis project application to the London School of Economics. Uh, more recently, Thornton's visualizations have increasingly come to include sound graphic scores uh, based on debt figures and what she calls debt courses. Uh, though, her, though presently categorized in several ac uh, accounts as social practice, I'm, I'm interested in also considering these sound of debt works in the context of, of debates connecting sound art theory with contemporary deba uh, debates in philosophy. While I attempt to address the discourse surrounding Mayasu's speculative materialism, Thornton's work will also invite an economic consideration of higher education. How much time do I have left? <laughs> oh man, I'm like not even halfway through. Um, so, how do I wrap this up? Um, I'll just go through and summarize everything that I'm going to talk about because I only have five more minutes. Um, so I was going to talk about this, which is the, um, an article post in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, uh, the Post-Gazette the Post -Gazette called Death of an Adjunct, describes this Mary Rocco, <coughs> an 83-year-old woman who died nearly homeless and without health insurance. She was making less than $25,000 a year, and that was compared in the article to the, um, uh, the president who was making $700,000. Um, and then there's numerous uh, writers and scholars who have been dealing with this phenomenon over the past like decade and a half. Um, Michael Peters, Frank Donahue, and um, Catherine Chaput are a few of them. Um, then I kind of get into um, like a little polemic with Seth Kim Cohen and Christoph Cox, as I kind of alluded to at the beginning. And I like really kind of like hound Christoph Cox for his like more like buying into the kind of discourse that speculative realism writes for itself. Uh, and you'll, you know, you'll have to find out how that ends. Um, but essentially, I, I, I sort of take issue with the fact that it seems to me to center around a materiality of sound. It has less to do with materialism as a philosophical uh, framework. Um, and there are other things, like I have this whole polemic about, like, that's somewhat similar to what composer, uh, writer Brian Kane calls musicophobic uh, discourse. The whole explosion in, in sound art theory is very uh, exemplary of this. And then I kind of wrap my way back to Maya Sue and do this like hardcore <laughs> critical reading of After Finitude. This is so great. I, don't even have, I didn't even have to write it. I can just like <laughs> Say really playbook nice. this thing. And then, essentially, I, I go through Mayasu and I do all this cool stuff, compare it to Lenin, 
um, because it's compared in, in all of the um, discourse and, scho and scholarship and so forth, I think it's been compared like four or five times by numerous uh, uh, writers. Um, and go back to that sort of question of science which links dialectical materialism and historical materialism in the Marxists of the 20th, the, the 20th century, which is highly, highly problematic because dialectical materialism, as people, some of you might know, is bullshit. It's absolute, like, a crock of crap. And the one writer who kind of works on this that I found very, very interesting is this, um, I don't know what to call him, Tom, uh, 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 Paul Thomas, who wrote a book about um, sci scientific socialism and sort of how Marx never uttered the words dialectical materialism nor historical materialism. Um, it was really through this translational screw up that I described earlier. So like Marx was more talking about Wissenschaft, for example. Engels like took the English translation science and kind of ran with it and then you know you get Lenin and you get of course um, this other guy <laughs> Uh, and, and, and other things that, that then sort of develop into this philosophical doctrine that ultimately has nothing to do with Marx. Okay, how is that relevant to Mayasu and speculative realism and so on? Well, um, Peter Howard's sort of critique of Mayasu, one of them is, uh, his words are something like, um, with and after Marx, how does this account, how does a system of thought account for social transformation and, and change. Um, because it, when you get down to it, Mayasu is kind of anti-contradictory, sort of like it, uh, uh, reality is not contradictory. It can't be because then it, that precludes this whole contingency and eventually is kind of hyper chaos thing, right? So Peter Howard's kind of provocation is with and after Marx how to think social transformation. Okay, Nathan Brown comes and his rejoinder to that is like, well, no, actually, uh, Maya Sue can be thought of as a continuation of, or his words, a continuation of dialectical materialism and, and historical materialism. Minds should explode by now, right? I mean, so this is kind of the best that we can do in terms of with and after Marx as far, you know, as far as the cano canonical speculative realism stuff at the time. So I'm just sort of pointing that stuff out and then there's a really like wonderful little moment in in Paul Thomas's work where he like you know kind of try, just sums up the whole um, catastrophe that was dialectical materialism you know it's this philosophical doctrine that's somewhere between philosophy and bullshit and like um, uh, 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 ideology of course and you know it was ultimately a kind of self-perpetuating like machine that sort of warranted all of the murders that Stalin did and so forth. And so eventually he says, you know, after, uh, 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 what, what is it, like this, um, uh, crap, it's called by someone a, like an intellectual um, disaster, essentially. And so I kind of use that a little bit to foreshadow a kind of intellectual disaster um, in the making, which is this sort of you know, problem of the knowledge economy sort of eating itself <coughs> alive, in a sense. I don't use that 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 language, though. Um, but maybe I'll just read the last sure, concluding ahead. paragraph. You got all the juicy stuff out of the way, or all the boring stuff, whichever way you look at it. <coughs> so after the intellectual disaster thing, which is lick, t lick time, he called it an intellectual disaster, where then does the reply to the challenge of thinking with and after Marx, which with such an intellectual disaster as dialectical materialism leave us in thinking the debt left by philosophical materialism, the unfulfilled legacy of practical critical activity originally advocated by Marx. Indeed, to compare, again, the practice of artistic practice dubiously recuperated by social practice MFA programs is most provocative in Thornton's deployment because it directly confronts the oppressive debt machinery that produces it. In a different sense, is it not evidence of an equivalent intellectual disaster when the most strident critique of the capitalist beast becomes thoroughly recuperable within its economy of knowledge production, the production of ideas ultimately reducible to real material exploitation of the kind suffered by Vojko, the 83-year-old adjunct? Um, 
for it seems to be a dynamic inescapable even by a kind of Ranciarian radical emancipatory pedagogy. By extension, the various uh, post-occupy alternative education projects, while well-meaning, remain categorically complicit with the logic of neoliberalism. The mountains of debt invested in critique will perhaps never resolve the need to create universal, public, open, and indeed free education, not for the few, but for all. I want to conclude with a meditation on the appearance of space in Thornton's student debt imaginary and the ancestral arc fossil of Maya Sue. Each presents the thought of a certain kind of deferral, the beyond of a capacity to be wholly other of the present moment. Each posits a special kind of suspension of the, of the down here by virtue of the out there. Each is underpinned by the precarious contingency of the production of human thought. Ultimately, beyond thought, there is still nevertheless a space for doing, for active change, as Marx insisted in his thesis on Feuerbach. By tethering this outer space to the down here world of human practice, Thornton's work pits a materialism of practical engagement against the abstract materialism of Mayasu's space fossil. It is, after all, only philosophers who have analyzed the world. It seems now up to artists, doubtless against the debilitating effects of debt, to change it.